Welcome to the SAS Support Group Meeting. Today, we are discussing diet, the do's and the don'ts. As much as we are offering advice, this advice is based on the most common scenarios and the information is compiled to empower you, the ostomate, to better understand and navigate your new normal. We will always advocate that you consult with your physician or your stoma nurse because they understand your unique set of circumstances better than we could. If you do need to find a stoma nurse, the South African Stomal Therapy Association, or SASA for short, have a list of registered stoma therapists on their website. Please contact www.stoma.co.za. Alternatively, contact SAS via WhatsApp on 066-261-0654 or on our website www.sastomates.org.za. Sorted. Okay. All right. So uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, Faisal, thank you um, for this collaboration. Um, for those who are not aware, the South African Stomal Therapy Association is the professional association for nurses who are specialized in or who work in the field of stoma wound or continence care and was first established back in 1978. So it, um, it is an association which has long standing in South Africa. And uh, the objectives of SASA is um, to the education of nurses in the speciality in the field of, of stomal therapy. Uh, stomal therapy in itself is a tri-speciality uh, in that nurses who, who study stomal therapy as a speciality should be able to do stoma, wound and continence care. Having read uh, all of your questions or seen so many of the questions coming through on the WhatsApp group, I reached out to Faisal and said, look, let's see if we can't, through the forum of SAS, uh, find a way where we can provide some ongoing education or really some basic lifestyle skills um, uh, for, for all of you who have stomas, who have undergone diversionary surgery and where you may not have received the, the information that you need or things have changed and maybe there's some way through this um, forum we can provide some form of assistance. I am a stomal therapist. I've been uh, in the field of stomal therapy now for 31 years. I do have a private practice down in Cape Town and I am the current president of the South African Stomal Therapy Association. So over the forthcoming months, um, I'm hoping that some of our members from the South African Stomal Therapy Association will uh, join me in assisting me in, in, um, in these meetings with SAS. Um, in providing you with some tangible information and useful um, lifestyle uh, tips um, to, to help you all going forward. Is, is start off by giving a little bit of an overview. Um, it's, you know, I can't just launch into talking about diet uh, when, um, you know, I without giving a little bit of a, an overview. So I wanted to start off by saying that each and every one of you is unique. Each and every one of you are individuals in your own right. You are all special individual people. And that may be what, what defines you is, is your gender, your age, your body shape, your skin type, your skin color, how tall you are or how short you are what your weight is, are you slim, are you slightly pudgy like I am, or you know, are you carrying a bit more weight? What is your mobility like? Are you easily mobile or are you confined to a wheelchair? Do you need to use a walking stick? Um, what is your eyesight like? What is your manual dexterity like? That means how well can you use your hands? And that list can go on and on and on. Um, you also all do, some, if you do work, you all do some kind of different work. Some of you do manual work. Some of you do desk jobs. Some of you might be nurses. Some of you are airline pilots. Um, some of you 
uh, might be involved with working in water or um, underground. Uh, everyone has different hobbies and activities that they participate in. Uh, different sports, which you um, may be involved in, so running, cycling, swimming, and some of you may have actually stopped your sports uh, because of having a stoma. We're all different from a religious background, if we do have a religion. And then every single ostomate is different again in terms of their disease process, the type of operation that you may have had, the type of stoma that you've got, and any ongoing treatment that you might have. So what I was trying to highlight here is that there are so many permutations and we haven't, you know, we haven't even started breaking down the different types of stomas and the different disease process. But if we just have a look at this one slide and have a look at all the different permutations, what we come out with each time is somebody absolutely individual who has their own requirements as far as managing their stoma is concerned and as far as managing the lifestyle issues around having um, a stoma. So let's just talk a little bit about the gastrointestinal tract. And the gastrointestinal tract, as we would call it in the medical field, is often referred referred to as in with other names. So it's sometimes called the digestive system. It's sometimes called the intestines. Some people refer to it as the bowels. Some people call it their gut. And some people actually refer to the intestines or the gastrointestinal system as their stomach. Uh, whereas the stomach actually is a part of the gastrointestinal system. So your gastrointestinal system actually starts at your mouth and it ends all the way down the bottom at your anus. So if we have a look at this um, clear diagram here, you've got your gastrointestinal tract, which is a hollow muscular tube, which starts at your mouth. It goes down into your esophagus your esophagus then feeds into your stomach over here, which is a reservoir, which starts the whole digestive process of, of breaking down the food. The, the, the food that has been broken down then drops down into your small intestine. And there is meters and meters of small intestine and approximately six meters in all on average. So again, we're all unique. Some of us have got slightly longer small intestines than others, but on average, the small intestine is about six meters long. The other very unique feature about the small intestine is that inside the small intestine are lots and lots and lots and lots of little finger-like protrusions, and those are called villi. And those villi, if you had to spread out the small intestine, would cover the surface area of a tennis court. And it is this part of your intestine that is responsible for the absorption of nutrients from your food. So from the small intestine, where's my little cursor gone? The small intestine then feeds into the large intestine or the colon or the bowel, the large bowel. And your large bowel runs up the right side of your body. It runs across the top half, the transverse colon, down to the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, and then down into this very special organ over here, which is called the rectum. And the rectum is the part of the gastrointestinal tract that holds your stool before you go to the toilet, okay? And many patients who end up with a stoma have had their rectums removed. And from the rectum, we have the anus. So this whole system here is called the gastrointestinal tract. 
It is one continuous tube, but it is broken down into different sections. There are many different areas within the gastrointestinal tract that a stoma can be made from. So you might have a stoma that is made from your small intestine or your ileum, and that is called an ileostomy. So that stoma would be somewhere along this six meters of bowel or small intestine that we were talking about. Or you may have your stoma constructed out of the colon or the large intestine. So that is somewhere along this one and a half meters of large intestine. And the colostomy might be situated in the right hand side of the colon or up in the transverse colon or down on the left hand side of the colon. And the the site of the stoma or the area of bowel that the stoma is constructed from is all dependent on what your disease process is. And there are lots and lots of reasons why patients may have a stoma. Yes, cancer is one of them. Ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, diverticulitis, trauma, uh, volvulus, Sometimes babies are born with congenital disorders. They require stomas. So there's lots and lots of reasons why a patient may have to undergo an operation to have a stoma done. And the site of that stoma, whether it's a small bowel stoma or whether it's a large bowel stoma, and where within that bowel that stoma is situated is based on the disease process and what operation the doctor needs to do. Every stoma looks different. So every single one of you, every single one of you, even if you all had a right-sided colostomy, all of your colostomies would look different. Every single one. Okay, so Stomas look different because of the different type of stoma. So it's either an ileostomy or a right-sided colostomy or a transverse colostomy or a left-sided colostomy. It's also different because of the type of stoma construction. So you get an end stoma, and I'm not going to go into detail of, with this. If at some point further down the line, in a couple of months' time, anyone wants more knowledge about the different stomas, we can do that. But um, for now, trust me that you can have an end stoma, a loop stoma, or you might have what we call a divided stoma, which has two loops. And very often we see that in children. The shape of each stoma is different. And that it's different because each person is unique. And the construction of that stoma by the surgeon is different. The size of the stoma will be different and the place on your abdomen where that stoma has been placed will be different. Now, if we go and look again at the gastrointestinal tract, throughout the, the, the tract and throughout the small intestine and the large intestine, the type of poo or the consistency of the stool or the poo changes. It's different. So once the mixed up food from the stomach drops down into the small intestine, the consistency of that stool is very watery. And as it slowly, I keep losing my cursor, there we go. As the stool slowly starts to move through the small intestine, it slowly gets a little bit thicker. Little bits start to form. So that if you have an ileostomy that's down towards the end of the six meters, the type of stool that should be coming out of there should be a little bit mushy, like a runny porridge. 
because there is no absorption of water during this phase over here or while the stool is moving through the small intestine, there's no chance that the stool can ever be a formed stool. So anybody who's got an ileostomy will always have a looser stool. What will change is whether that ileostomy is at the end of the six meters or whether in fact for operative reasons and for because of the disease process, the stoma is sitting higher up towards the stomach. If the stoma is sitting higher up in the bowel, then the stool that comes out of that ileostomy is really going to be very watery. So, so only once the, the stool from the small intestine starts to drop into the colon and water absorption is taking place, the poo then starts to thicken up. And as it moves along, it will start to get more and more and more solid until it reaches this left-hand side down to a left-sided colostomy. So the stool on the right side here is still a bit mushy, like a, a thick porridge. And as it moves along and the water is absorbed from the stool, the stool will become thicker and thicker and become more formed. That is under normal circumstances. That is, that is what the baseline is. That without any other factors coming into play that is affecting the, the stool consistency. So I think what's really, really, really important to remember is that everybody's bowel habits are different. And every one of you, before you had your stomas, you would have had different bowel habits. Every single one of us is different. Some of us go to the toilet once a day. Some of us go to the toilet twice a day. Some of us only go to the toilet every three days. So sometimes it's good to cast your mind back and remember maybe what your stool or your bowel habits were like before you had your stoma. So what can affect the consistency of the stool? Well, it's where in the gut the stoma is made. We've just discussed that. It's also very dependent on how much bowel has been removed or bypassed. So depending again on what the disease process is and what operation was needed, that will depend on how that will result in a certain amount of your bowel having been removed or bypassed. Other um, factors that can affect the stool consistency is if you have had radiation therapy, if you've had chemotherapy or you're currently receiving chemotherapy, if you are any on any sort of medications. Even antibiotics can affect the consistency affect of the stool. The consistency. If you have an infection, that can actually cause you to have a looser, more watery stool. It could also mean that you've got a gastroenteritis. Your food and fluid intake can affect the stool consistency. We're going to discuss that a little bit more. And also if you partake in any exercise. I'm kind of repeating myself here a little bit, but I think it's important that, or have I gone backwards? Uh, no. Um, is to remind you that the stool consistency will be different based on where in the colon your colostomy is situated. We're now going to talk specifically about colostomies. Right. So if you've got an ascending colostomy, your stool consistency is going to be far looser than if you have a colostomy on the left-hand side. Or if you've got a colostomy up in the transverse colon, it's also still going to be more loose than if you have a colostomy on the left-hand side. That is not to say that if you have a colostomy on the left, that you'll never have a runny stool. 
you can have a runny stool. So the question always is, I've got a colostomy, what can I eat? What? And the general rule for a person who has a colostomy is that you can eat anything and everything in moderation. Anything and everything in moderation. And I think the word moderation is really, really important here. If you go and sit and eat uh, a bag of nuts, you're going to run into problems. If I sat and ate a bag of nuts and I don't have a stoma, I'm going to have problems tomorrow. I'm going to be running off to that loo. If I ate a, a, a big uh, bag of popcorn, that is going to affect my stool output tomorrow. But if I have a moderate amount, a handful of nuts, and I chew it well, or a handful of popcorn and I've chewed it well, it shouldn't make too much of a difference. So moderation is really important. And I have left off a point here and chewing your food well is an important point. A person with a colostomy should also take in adequate fluids. So when we talk about fluids, we talk about water, tea, coffee, soup, juices, collectively, that is your fluids. And on average, someone should probably have between one and a half and two liters of fluid a day. Some people like to drink lots and lots and lots of water. If that's something you've always done and your body's used to it, well, then you can carry on. Uh, but, you know, again, I believe in moderation rather than excess. Please ensure that if you are on a specific dietary requirement, so for example, if you are a diabetic, if you have high blood pressure and you've been put onto a low salt diet or any other special diet that has been prescribed by your doctor for the sake of another health issue that you have, then it's important that you stick to that diet as well. Be aware that some foods can cause increased wind or flatus. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say to you, give you a long list of foods that can cause wind. Remember right at the beginning, I said, you're all unique. We're all unique. Okay. Some people can eat broccoli and not have a problem. Other people eat broccoli and they get a lot of wind. Some people eat onions and they get a lot of wind and other people can eat onions and they're perfectly fine. So it would be irresponsible for me to sit here and say, here's a long list of foods that can potentially cause wind. What is important here is that you need to work out what doesn't work for you by trial and error. So if you eat cauliflower and broccoli for dinner tonight and you are blowing wind like crazy tomorrow and it worries you that you're blowing that wind, then you choose to cut out or cut down on broccoli and cauliflower but the next person might be able to eat cauliflower and broccoli, uh, eat cauliflower and broccoli with no impact at all. So I, it's, I can't sit here and give you a list of foods and say, don't eat these. We need to work out what doesn't work for you. Having wind or flatus is also not a reason not to eat something. So if you really, really, really like cauliflower, and it does make you a bit windy, it doesn't mean you should never eat cauliflower again. Rather choose the time that you eat the cauliflower. So don't have cauliflower the day before you're going to a wedding or you're going into a meeting or you're going to church. Eat it on, on an evening where you know the next day if your bag blows up with a bit of wind and you farting away, you can go off to the bathroom 
and let that wind out of your bag. It's not a reason to cut things out of your diet. It's how it's it's about finding a way how to manage what works for you. Be aware that some foods can cause discomfort. Um, and, and that discomfort might be heartburn, it could be bloating. I know if I drink a beer, it's so full of gas, I feel terribly uncomfortable afterwards and I might have a runny tummy the next day. So the same applies here. When you have a colostomy, your bowel has been shortened slightly. Everything else that used to happen to you before will continue to, happy, uh, continue to happen. Some foods can make the stool a bit looser. So if you have a hot, spicy curry for lunch, chances are you're going to have a looser stool to empty out of your bag tonight and maybe tomorrow morning. Again, it's not a reason not to have that curry. It's about knowing if I eat a curry tonight, I need to put a drainable bag on tomorrow because I'm going to have a slightly looser stool than I normally have. And remember, if you have a colostomy, it is possible to become constipated, but it's we need to identify why someone's become constipated. And it is also possible to have diarrhea. There's a really, really nasty tummy bug doing the rounds at the moment throughout South Africa. People have got terrible diarrhea. And it could just be that you've picked up the bug. It's not the colostomy's fault. It's not what you've eaten's fault. It's not your bag's fault. There's a bug doing the round and you've got gastroenteritis or you've got a bit of diarrhea. So we need to manage that until um, it clears up again. Sorry, right. so before I move on to ileostomy, let's let's so, um, get some questions going on colostomy. Okay, yeah. So there was a question, and I think it was around about the uh, intake of fluids. Uh, Lorato asks, please talk about the benefits of hydration solutions. How often do you use them? They don't come cheap, so trying to plan best. Okay, so Lorato, I'm going to I will discuss that under ileostomy. There should be no reason for a, on a, under a normal circumstance. And please remember, I'm discussing now where everything is, in, it, it, everything is in status quo. The stars are aligned. Everything is, is you know, is uh, use of the word normal. But, but you're not having chemotherapy. You're not currently having radiation. You haven't got gastroenteritis. There is no need for a colostomate to, there should be no need, let me rephrase that, for a colostomate to have rehydrate or hydration solutions. The hydration solutions and rehydrate come in on the patient who has an ileostomy. So I'll discuss that just now. Does that answer your question, Laratu? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. We, it's very, I think this is what I picked up on the WhatsApp group was that I've, and I, I could be wrong, but I think there's some, there's some of you who are not even really sure what type of stoma you have. And it's really important to try and find out from your doctor or from your stoma nurse, do I have a colostomy or do I have an ileostomy? If I have a colostomy, which part of the colon has it been constructed from? If I have an ileostomy, where about in my small intestine is it? Because then immediately we can start to work out what's going on. Um, I see someone else has got the high, a hand up. Hand up it's yeah, high uh, sense. It's high sense, yeah. So, um, high sense. Yeah. Um, not too sure who high sense is, but please. Uh, you can go ahead. It's Ashley. Hi, Ashley. Uh, hi, Ashley. There we go. Mm -hmm. Now I can see the face. <laughs> okay. Um, my question is, um, I have a colostomy, and the problem I'm having is every now and again, my stool gets really hard. I do eat a lot of food that loosens my stool, but every now and again, it gets really hard, and then it turns green. My stool turns green. 
do you have any idea what could be causing that? Okay, I'm, I'm not sure why it would be green, um, unless it's something that you are eating in particular. Uh, sorry, Ashley, I, th I think, Ashley, aren't you on um, chemo at the moment as well? I just, I finished my chemo in August last year. Oh, okay. Last year, okay. Are you taking any medications? No, I'm not on anything at the moment. Not on anything. Okay. Only painkillers, that's channel and Panadol. Okay. All right. So so the 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 painkillers can cause a bit of constipation. Um, I'm going to suggest, and I actually meant to put it into the presentation and I forgot. So I will send it to Faisal and he can circulate it. I think what is very helpful when we are unsure of what's what's happening and why it's happening is to keep a food diary yeah. for about yeah. two or three weeks. So what you would do is say Monday, seven o'clock, what you had for breakfast, what you had for your snack, what you had to drink and go through the day. And at the same time, document your bowel movements. So what type of bowel movement did you have? When did you have to empty your pouch? What was the stool consistency like? What was the color of the stool? And then we can have a look at it over a couple of week period. And with your stomach care nurse or with your doctor, they can have a look at it and they can maybe see a pattern where there's something that is causing you to become a bit more constipated or there's something that you are eating that is discoloring your stools. So I think, I think one of the things that happens when, when, when one has a stoma as well is because it's now right in your line of sight and you, you emptying the pouch, everybody is examining their poo all the time. Whereas before we sat on the loo and we flushed it down the loo and we didn't look, did we, Ashley? Yeah. Whereas now we're examining the color of our stool all the time. And um, I mean, I drank a beetroot juice yesterday and if I'd had a good look at my stool this morning, it would have been red and I would have thought that I was bleeding, but that was from the beetroot. Okay. So, okay. so I think sometimes we, we spend too much time uh, examining the color of our stool. So I'm not, I'm not terribly worried about the color of the stool. However, um, becoming constipated or having very hard stools, and if it's making you um, uncomfortable, then we need to address that. Um, or your doctor or your stoma care nurse needs to give you advice on what you need to do to avoid becoming constipated. It might be as simple as adding a few prunes to your diet every morning or some all bran flakes, mm -hmm. or, or it might need that you actually need a stool softener, something like Dufalac or Laxon that you take. I got Laxon. So if you've got Laxon, it's, you know, maybe take a tablespoon when you can see that your stool is starting to get a little bit hard, take a tablespoon of it the night before and then just keep the flow of the stool going nicely. Okay. I hope that answers your question, Ashley. It does. I have one more before we before I unmute. Um, they discovered that uh, my colostomy is got a narrow is gone narrow on the inside. In other words, uh, yeah. the passage. The nose. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Between the nose and inside towards my navel, it has narrowed. And I think okay. maybe that's what's also causing uh, the discomfort. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, the swelling, I have a hernia and they're trying to address that at the moment. And last okay. week I went for a CT scan and they discovered that I've got lumps again. So tomorrow I'm going back to the hospital for another um, observation checkup and they're going to see what they're going to do because I was supposed to have a reversal, but they said because of that, they can't do it. I can't do it. I'm sorry to hear yeah. that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, look, at some point further down the line, uh, in a couple of months' time, we're going to discuss parastomal hernias. I think they're a bugbear for so many ostomates, um, and they really are uh, tricky to manage. Um, surgery on, on hernias are also problematic, uh, but certainly 
Um, Ashley, I'm glad you mentioned that you've got a narrowing, what we would call a stenosis. If that is the case, and if they've identified it, then it's even more important that you keep your stool as soft as possible. So probably taking, you know, two teaspoons of Laxon every night, um, just to keep that stool soft. Uh, I think that is, is important. It's probably what we would advise our patients. I'm erring on the side of caution on giving too much advice here. I don't know you, I've never consulted with you. Um, so I would like you to speak to, to your stomach care nurse um, or, you know, if, or, or to your doctor to, to get some more definitive information. Um, <laughs> going back to Ashley's um, first point of, you know, just um, having a, an issue with the with the stool that is um, that is uh, not soft. So I depended actually on on the hydration solution because I found that it helped me a lot. Um, the more I I used it, the more my my stool got softer. Right. So that's why I thought maybe um, maybe I could use that, and that's what I wanted to find out in terms of the benefits. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to touch base on the laxon as well. All these laxatives that actually soften the stool. I was worried that there could be a danger of having your, you know, your stoma just lapsing or whatever they call it. It's like just yeah. not being able to, yeah, just just relaxing and then obviously just coming okay. out. Yeah, so I, I was just I worried about the overusing, the overusage of, of laxatives. You know, so uh, maybe just tell us the dangers around that as well. Sure, Lorato. Um, okay, so so I would err on the side of caution on on drinking um, rehydrate solutions um, mm. because they are high in salt content, um, okay. and so you know unless you are losing salt, um, which an ileostomate would be doing, uh, depending on their output. And we're going to discuss ileostomies just now. Um, I would err on the side uh, on the on the side of caution on on drinking rehydrate solutions as a solution to constipation. I would yeah. say rather, you know, you should rather be including some more soluble fibers into your diet, um, you know, um, or, or drinking half a glass of prune juice, uh, which works very well, or making some stewed fruit um, with dried fruit you know, um, all brand flakes, Weetabix to try and um, um, keep your stool soft if, if that's what you need to do. Um, if, if you are on pain medication that is constipating or any other medication that is constipation, taking a stool softener such as Laxon or Duperan or one of those mm -hmm. um, is pretty safe to use. Um, I think what you were describing is um, what what can happen uh, in people who abuse laxatives, mm -hmm. um, and and usually, you know, people who abuse laxatives have also got um, issues with with diet, um, um, not diet so much, but with their weight and their body image. So you find uh, people who are um, anorexics sometimes. Um, abuse laxatives and use laxatives in excess. Um, and then over a long period of time, uh, that could um, affect the natural movement of the bowel, which is called peristalsis. It would make the bowel lazy. Yeah. Okay. But in this situation, you know, again, that word moderation comes up. Um, if, if it's necessary to use and it's used wisely and within, um, you know, within the dosage requirements, then it's it's safe to use. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, um, sister, I wanted to find out, I've, uh, the last two weeks, I have been having a loss of appetite. I've tried, um, I tend to eat a lot of things with uh, salt in, and then one, two, three, I'm wanting something sweet, and then next thing, I don't feel like eating anything at all. Do you know what could be causing that? Um, yeah, Ashley, you know, I think, um, what, what was the reason for you having your stoma in the first place? I had, um, a mess in the, in my stomach, which they removed okay. the last year this time. And they discovered that it, it started to spread to my left ovary. 
which also had lumps as well, hence them removing that mass. And then they, they, they gave me, a, I got a colostomy on the right, left hand side. Okay. All right. I, my mom is um, my mom is also uh, cancer. She's she's got colon cancer as well. She's uh, three years now in remission. <clears throat> and what age are you, Ashley? If you don't mind me asking. I'm forty six this year. So you're very you're very young. Um, look, Ashley. Um, loss of appetite. Um, very often goes hand in hand with some disease process that's going on. Um. I think what's what's important for you over the next couple of weeks while you're being investigated again, um, when are you going back to the hospital? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Uh, while you're being investigated is really just to, to try and maintain your fluid intake. Um, it's important to stay hydrated. Uh, and it sounds Lorato now like I'm contradicting myself, but but what I'm saying is that if you're eating and drinking nothing, as a as a general person, you'd become dehydrated. So Ashley, if you if you're not feeling like eating, at least please drink something. And whatever you drink, try to make that nutritious. So okay. maybe try and get some insure so that you can drink uh, some insure that gives you some nutrients. Um, or soups, uh, you know, ice cream, custard, it's got a bit of protein in it. Um, okay. And and try that whatever you are able to eat is is of the highest nutritional value um, okay. at this stage. Okay, Ms. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, All right, so ileostomies as a rule are a bit more difficult to manage. They really are. And... Um, the stool consistency yeah, and the quality yeah. of stool. Hey right, guys, we need you guys on the Loratu. What's uh, <laughs> humane? There we go. She's muted. Okay. okay. Um, so the stool consistency and the quantity of stool, the volume of stool from an ileostomy is going to be different dependent on where in the small intestine your stoma is. And I really spoke about that earlier. So the higher up in the small intestine, when I say higher up, the closer towards your stomach the stoma is, the more watery the stool is going to be. And the closer it is to where it feeds into the colon, it will still be loose, but the, but the quantity the volumes should be a bit less. So an accepted output from an ileostomy is about one liter in 24 hours. That is what we, we believe is manageable and that patients can manage in terms of emptying their pouch and in terms of maintaining their hydration status and their fluid intake. But understand that if someone's had radiation, is on chemotherapy, or has had larger portions of their small intestine resected, that the output is definitely going to be more watery and a much higher volume. And then it becomes really, really important that you work very closely with your stomach care nurse or your doctor in terms of maintaining your hydration. That is really, really important. Um, so a few tips that I can give you um, on, um, uh, on diet with an ileostomy is under the do list is do eat small regular meals. So you, you need to almost become like a little hamster where you are just munching away all day because as you are eating, as you are throwing food down that tube, it is helping to absorb the water and the liquid that is in that gut. And so it starts to hopefully thicken the stool a little bit and slow down the, the volume of, of stool that's going to come out of your ileostomy. 
We um, recommend to our patients to adopt the sip and snack technique. So you on the hour, so in other words, six o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock. And so you go on every hour on the hour where possible, have a little something to eat. So whether it's half a slice of toast with some peanut butter on it, two bites of a banana, a couple of salty cracks. Um, and then at lunchtime, you have a sandwich with some cheese on it or some, uh, you know, a, some chicken on it or tuna fish um, or some pasta, rice, potatoes, all of those type of foods help to thicken the stool with an ileostomy. Okay. On the half hour, so if you've had something to eat at six o'clock in the morning, you've had, you've woken up and you've had a piece of toast with some peanut butter on it, or you've had a little bit of a yogurt, then at half past six, have your half a cup of tea or half a cup of coffee or your fruit juice or whatever you're going to have. On the fruit juice story, it's preferable to cut down on the sugary um, drinks and foods because they can contribute to the stool being watery. And then where necessary, you know, we, we ha sometimes have to add, not sometimes, actually quite often, we have to add medications to help slow down the flow of that loose stool through the small intestine and to help thicken the stool. And we use um, medications such as Lomatil, Imodium, Fibrogel, Smecta, but really these medications need to be prescribed and, um, and, and worked with under the guidance of your stoma nurse. So I'm not going to sit here and say you must take Two, two emodiums four times a day, because in fact, you might only need two twice a day, or you might need two eight times a day, because I don't know where in your gut your ileostomy is. I don't know what your output is like. So it's really important that a plan is put together for you under the guidance of your stomach care nurse. And again, keeping a food and stool diary is very helpful in seeing what advice your stoma care nurse needs to give you in terms of maybe you eating something that is contributing to the runny tummy and other times you're eating things which help to thicken it. And we can pull those, uh, that information out of a, a food diary for you and to help sort that out. Drinking large amounts of fluid with an ileostomy is, is, is really not the way to go. And particularly drinking of water. Right up in your small intestine, just after your stomach, is a small part of the small intestine that's called the jejunum. And the jejunum is what produces the salt that your body needs. And when you have an ileostomy, it is easy to lose your salt content from your body. And if you are drinking lots of water, if you're throwing water down, if you're drinking lots and lots of water, all that you are doing is diluting the salt even more and putting yourself into a dehydrated state. Wow. So if your ileostomy is running, the management is actually to pull back on your fluids and to restrict your fluids. You still need to have enough fluids, but you need to restrict your fluids and you need to be particularly careful about how much water you're drinking. You also need to cut down on the sugary drinks. And this is where adding a sachet or two of rehydrate in a day can be of benefit. But again, if you've got an end ileostomy, 
and you are draining between 800 and 1,000 mils in 24 hours, you shouldn't need any hydrate, rehydrate. Your, the, your fluids and your food that you're eating and the little bit of salt that you add to your food will be adequate. But if your ileostomy is higher up in your gut or you're busy having chemotherapy or radiation or something else is going on and you are pouring from your ileostomy, well, then we've got to make another plan. So we need to then add the rehydrate. We need to cut back on the water. We need to increase some of the medications to try and slow it down. It's really very complex and there's no one solution or one size fits all here. We, you, you, all, you need to be working in conjunction with your stoma care nurse here in terms of managing your ileostomy output. But I think what's really important is to understand that if you've got an ileostomy, you will always have a looser stool. You will always need to be emptying your pouch four or five times a day, and probably at least once during the course of the night. And I know that, that it's hard. I know that it's hard because you empty your bag at 10 o'clock, nine o'clock or 10 o'clock before you go to bed. And then at two or three o'clock in the morning, you need to get up and empty your pouch again. Because if you don't, you're going to end up with a, a bag that's burst in the morning. Um, but, but having an ileostomy, there, there's no getting away from the fact that, that that is the reality of an ileostomy and that the stool will never, ever, be the consistency of a colostomy. Quinn, you've got your hand up. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so I have an ileostomy, and and yeah, you're quite right. The management of where the once one minute will be watery, the next minute I can get it a bit thicker, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. I'm eating a lot of starches. Um, mm. Probably two bread rolls in the morning, even some pop, which I find binds with works no milk. Really well. It's mm. with no milk. I found with no milk works well. Um, am I damaging other parts of my body by eating so much starches? Yeah, it's often a it's often a question we get. Um, you know that um, you know your carbohydrates is. I think there's such an angst against carbohydrates because of weight gain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The reality is that if you've got an ileostomy and the chance chances of you putting on significant amount of weight is unlikely. Um, I think that that you do need a certain degree of starches to help thicken your stool. But there yeah. are other uh, foods that you can have that, that also help to thicken the stool, such as peanut butter, such as cheese, boiled um, milk. Boiled um, milk can work. I'm actually, um, I'm actually lucky. I'm pretty much eating anything and everything. Fantastic. Um, how, mm. However, I'm finding that when the stool is, so, is quite thick, when it sits right at the top of the bag by the stoma, the stoma itself gets quite irritated. Yeah. So much so that it's a little gets a bit raw. Um, mm. That I'm finding that I'm actually squirting stoma powder all over the stoma just to dry it out and relieve yeah. it a bit. When it's watery, it's fine. But I do go to the, the I have to empty the bag sometimes every twice uh, every hour. So yeah, it's, quite a, it's quite a, it's quite a, yeah, I've got a very high output, but, and then, and then one more question I just wanted to ask you. Mm. So the doctor is, he's talking reversals, but I mean, I was born with Hirschsprung's disease. So mm. the fact, the fact that, um, the fact that, look, I've only just had a part uh, bag now, everything's yes. been pretty normal, except my stool has never been a formed stool ever in my life. So I, yes. I know no different except for now having a bag. Yes. The one thing now he's talking of is reversal. And yes. I had such problems with my anus and my rectum that I'm nervous to go back that I'm quite comfortable where I'm at right now. The emotional and social aspect of getting used to the bag and how people see me, et cetera. I think that's my biggest dilemma yeah. where I'm at right now. Yeah. Um, 
the 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 fact of the managing of the bag i'm learning and i have learned i mean through all the years what to eat what not to eat etc it's pretty much the same i'm just saying that when it does get a bit thick around the stoma it actually irritates the stoma Okay, let me give you a little tip there. And that's mm. one of the things, one of the topics that I, I had written down for Faisal to say that we actually need to do a session on. Um, one, of, one of the complaints that the colostomates have is that they, they talk about something called pancaking. pancaking. And you are talking about something now very similar to pancaking. So um, we, I'm, I'm cognizant of time. I don't know how long... Uh, these meetings usually go on for. Um, so it definitely is a topic that we're going to spend some time on at a later date. But just to say to all of you now is one a small little tip that works wonders is always, always make sure that you have got a little bit of air puffed into your bag. So once you have emptied, if you've gone to the toilet and you've emptied your pouch and you've You've pushed the stool out of the out of your pouch. You've cleaned the bottom end, and you've closed your clip. It's either a clip or it's got an integrated closure. You've done your roll up and you've closed it. What's happened is that the two layers of the bag have now sucked together. Okay, because you've pushed the stool out. Now, when the next lot of stool arrives out of the stoma it struggles to fall down into the pouch because the plastic is stuck together. So before you close that tail end, after you've cleaned it, pull it open. And I wish I'd brought a pouch with me, but uh, I'll do it next time. Pull the pouch, the two, the back end and the front end of the pouch open and literally push a bit of air in from the bottom. So pull it up. So up near the stoma, there's this little puff. I don't know if you can see my hands. Yeah. A little puff of, of air that's in the bag. So that as the stool comes out, it's got space to drop down to the bottom. Okay. And that, that helps with, with pancaking. It helps with any amount of stool sitting up around the top of the stoma. As soon as you've got ileostomy output, that's sitting around the stoma. If your seal around the stoma is not really tight, um, or it, it shouldn't be tight, but if it's not close enough to the stoma, the, um, the alkalinity, and it is alkaline, not acid, the alkalinity of the, of the poo from an ileostomy melts the seals around the product very, very quickly. So you want that stool to drop down. So try just puffing a bit of air in the bag, Kuhn, and just see if that works. And it's definitely a topic that we will cover um, in more detail in the coming months. Um, with regards to going for reversal, um, I think you should go and sit and have a really, really good chat with your stomatherapist um, about all the pros and cons and with your surgeon and having a temporary stoma does not mean it has to be temporary. Um, it doesn't mean you have to have the reversal. Lots of patients become comfortable with their stomas. They're scared about any further surgery. They're scared about what um, is going to transpire um, after their stoma is closed. Are you going to be incontinent? Are you going to manage to hold your mm, stool? And I exactly. think all of those things, you need to have a really, really good discussion with your mm. stoma therapist about, ask all the questions, and then go home and, and make an informed decision. Mm. Nobody, is, is, nobody should be, um, we don't ever uh, tell our patients what they should be doing. We give them all the information, and then you need to make the decision based on all that information. It's a tough I'm reading, one. I'm reading quite a few horror stories, I must be honest. Mm, it's a tough one. Mm. It's a tough one. Yeah. But get all the information um, and the, the appropriate information from the right sources and then sit down and, and make an informed decision. And if you, you know, I, the only thing I would say is that if you're unsure, then rather wait. And there's no, 
there's no cutoff date for you to have your reversal. So if you're reversed, you know, you don't have to have it done in three months time or six months or a year. It's, it's fine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, I've, I've heard this sort of tip come up a few times. Um, I've, uh, and actually the first time I heard it was a surgeon sharing it uh, at, at an event I was at. And on various support groups, I also see it thrown out a lot. And he's mm. taking something like a mar one or two marshmallows or jelly babies. Um, the gelatin in there apparently helps. Yeah, so <laughs> it's actually quite interesting, Faisal, because one of our surgeons um, who's emigrated many years ago to Australia, regrettably, because he was absolutely brilliant, he actually ran a, a, a bit of a trial at Kritiske <laughs> um, on marshmallows. And um, I think I think there's this fine balance between having a couple of marshmallows to help thicken, but having too many where yeah. the sugar content then um, pushes pushes the, the the effect that we want in the opposite direction. So, so, I suppose so then yes, you know, marshmallows okay. can do the trick. Where, I mean, we we. We say to our patients, have a couple of marshmallows, um, but you know, don't, you can't eat a bag of marshmallows. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, it's about that balance again. Um, and it's also about, you know, eating as nutritionally as possible. Um, in, you know, so thickening your stool while you're also eating healthily. So, sweet potato, butternut, pumpkin, you know, all of those, those things help to thicken the stool. Okay. There are a couple of, of um, foods that really ileostomates need to be careful of um, in case they cause a blockage, what we would call a bolus obstruction. And those foods are things like mushrooms, lentils, um, popcorn, um, corn off the cob, thick green vegetables. So not your broccolis and your spinaches and things, but things like bok choy, um, which is quite a thick green vegetable you need to be uh, careful of. Um, and um, also nuts, you need to be a little bit careful about nuts. Um, if, you, if you can restrict yourself to a small handful and you can chew them well, that's fine. Dried fruit, uh, can cause a bolus obstruction as well. So there are a couple of foods that you need to be careful of. If you're eating grapes, suck the flesh um, out of the skin uh, because those skins don't digest very easily and then they mulch together and they form what we call this bolus obstruction. So you can imagine like a ball of straw uh, that's sort of balled up and, and, and then it can get stuck. Um, and, and really important to chew your food uh, to your food well awesome. okay and then i think this is uh almost the last slide um flatus when farts <laughs> i so often hear patients complaining my bag is blowing up the <laughs> bag the bags are blowing up and i think it's important to know that the bag's not at fault here um, the wind or the flatus is coming from you. And really, I mean, it's, it's normal for a person to, to pass about half a liter to three liters of wind a day. That's a lot of wind. That's a lot of wind. And, and some people fart even more than that in 24 hours. Some people manage to burp some of their wind up. So that's good for them. But the reality is, is that, um, is that it's a natural course of events that we produce wind. And very often, I mean, we swallow a lot of wind when we're talking, we swallow wind while we're eating, we swallow wind if we're chewing gum, we swallow wind if we're smoking, we swallow a lot of air while we're sleeping. And many of you will, will if you take note, when you wake up in the morning, you go to the bathroom, you sit down on the loo to have a wee or the gentleman stand. And while you're having that wee, you're actually passing wind at the same time. It's, 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 it's part of the physiology of our, of our makeup. Um, 
Having said that, I understand that it um, can be embarrassing because you have no control over that wind. Um, you know, the, the only thing you can do is, is put your hand gently over your stoma and hope to muffle the sound <laughs> a little bit. And then to, to have a look and see what make what contributes to you having a bit more wind than normal. And if it means cutting that out or changing what you're doing um, to reduce the amount of wind, then um, I think that's that's what you're going to do. But but if you do get wind in your pouch, please you must empty the pouch of the wind or burp it if you're using a two-piece. Don't ever try and push the air out of your bag because if you apply pressure on the bag and you push the air out, what you've done in essence is you've broken the seal around the stoma. And if the air can escape, the stool or will escape as well. Okay. And then very last slide um, is, I'm not sure if there's anybody on the, the call who has a urostomy or an ileal conduit. Um, this is a stoma that drains urine. And we'll do a session on urostomies. But really a person, an ostomate who has a urostomy, you do need to drink adequate fluids. And, and this is the one time where you do need to up your fluid intake. Um, as far as diet is concerned, there should be no um, special diet at all. Um, of course, we should all be eating a healthy, moderate diet. Just understand some foods can make the urine smell a bit stronger. It's not a reason not to have it. Um, the pouches are odor proof, so it's going to, the urine will smell more when you go to empty your bag. But if it's a concern for you, then avoid those. And, and those are foods such as asparagus, eggs, onions, um, those sort of things. But again, having them in moderation uh, should help the process along. And then a urostomate also, we, we aim to keep the urine a bit more acidic um, to avoid uh, urinary tract infections. So we suggest that you either have some, some vitamin C or cranberry juice or cranberry capsules or some fresh orange juice every day to just try and maintain um, the um, and this more acidic pH um, of the urine. And I think that that is a lot of information for one. Yes. <laughs> um, I, 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 hope, I hope that's been of benefit to those who are on the call um, and that have managed to answer some questions. The subject is much bigger and you all need your own um, special attention from, mm. and, and I understand that there are gaps, but so where I or any of my colleagues can assist, please shout. <laughs>